Okay, children may be dismissed. Children's Church. You can go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 18. I'm going to start a new chapter this morning. We've been looking at Elijah the man, what he can teach us. We've been seeing that he's just an ordinary man. Um, God caused him to be an example of his power at work over the, the evils of the day that Elijah lived in. He's given us a powerful example of faithful prayer in James chapter 5. And to do that, he had to go there. We've talked about that. A, a place of complete surrender and trust in God. That happened as a result of the things that happened in his life. Last week, we looked at the -the on-the-job training that was necessary for the mission that lay ahead for Elijah. His education from his time spent at uh, the brook of Cherith and at Seraphath. When he first appeared in front of the king Ahab and announced the drought, he was a man of faith. However, as he passed through the trials of the dried brook and the empty flower jar and the dead sun, Elijah was transformed into a man of God. He's now a man prepared and wholly dedicated to the Lord. After a three-year period of being hidden away from public view, Elijah is now about to be brought back into the spotlight. God calls Elijah out of hiding and once again to confront Ahab. Elijah's first encounter is with a fellow believer by the name of Obadiah. While both are believers, the contrast between these men is striking. This is not the the same Obadiah that that wrote a book in the the scriptures. There's some discussion about that, but I I believe the evidence shows that he's not. But that's not important right now. Elijah is seen here to be a faithful, sold-out servant of God while Obadiah is pictured as more of a sellout. One who gives lip service to God, but by his life he denies the God he claims to serve. Sadly, there there are many people like Obadiah in the modern church. People who talk about being saved, who claim to love the Lord, but the lives they live deny him, his power, and his presence in their lives. Of course, this is as Paul said it would be in the last days. 2 Timothy 3.5, he says, Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. However, there is hope. It doesn't have to stay that way. So I'd like for us to listen on, in on this encounter between Elijah and Obadiah. Here we'll meet someone who is sold out and one that is a sellout. In fact, it might even meet ourselves this morning. We find that we're more like Obadiah than we're like Elijah. May God give us the grace to change today. So let's read our scripture passage this morning. 1 Kings chapter 18, we're going to be in, in verses 1 through 16. Open your Bibles there. If you don't have a, a Bible, there should be one in the chair in front of you. And it's on page 380 of the Chair Bible. I've been saying the Pew Bible, and I was reminded this past week, we don't have pews. But, <laughs> but I'm just, you know, a creature of habit. You know, it's a Pew Bible. So I, I'm making a, a point of saying it's a Chair Bible, okay? So there's one in front of you there. If you don't have a Bible of your own, consider that our gift to you. Um, so 1 Kings chapter... 18 verses 1 through 16. God's word says, And after many days the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. 
Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself, and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say, He is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or, or nation that they have not found you. Now you say, Go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the Spirit of the Lord will carry you I know not where. And so, when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth, has it not been told my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell the Lord. Behold, Elijah is here, and he will kill me. Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts live, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. So let's make a little comparison between these two. Before we get into their meeting, let's remind ourselves a little bit about Elijah that we've learned so far. Elijah is sold out for the Lord. He has gone through a lot of testing over the last three years. After all this time, Elijah is still serving the Lord. All the trials, all the difficulties he's had to, he's had to endure have, have not dulled his sense of service to, to God Almighty. They've not made him feel as though God has let him down. Just the opposite has been true. Elijah has been honed and to be an instrument of God's power and ability. He is now more than ready for the task that lies ahead for him. This is a man that is committed to serving God with his whole being. We've learned along with Elijah that God allows the trials that come into our lives so that they may help us, to grow us into his image. Romans 8, 28, all things work for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. According to his purpose. Of course, when the trials of life come, we can respond in one of two ways. We can allow the trials to drive us away from God, or we can allow the trials to bring us closer to God. May the Lord help us be like Elijah who walked through the valley and he came out on the other side still praising the name of the Lord. We see that in his obedience. The command from God is for Elijah to come out of hiding. Come out of hiding, present himself to his arch enemy, Ahab. For, for Elijah, this, this may have been more difficult, a more difficult command to obey than the one to hide himself. After all, the, the nation of Israel has been in a drought for over three years. Thousands have died as a result. Starvation is rampant. Poverty is, is all around. People are angry. And Elijah is the man who God used to announce that judgment, to announce that drought. The command to show yourself came when we were, there was every reason for him not to want to show himself to stay in hiding. If I were Elijah, I would want to stay in seclusion just a little bit longer. Send the rains, Lord, then I'll come. Right? <laughs> See, I told you God would do it. See? Should have believed me the whole time. No. He's got to show himself first. Elijah may not know all the details, but he knows God is still in control. God promises Elijah that if he will present himself to Ahab, God will send the rain again. But he has to present himself first. God's telling Elijah, things are going to work out. It's going to be okay. Trust me. 
Just trust me. Things are going to be all right. Elijah no doubt remembers the education and the training that he's received. God has been faithful. God has protected. God has provided over these these past three years, even when it didn't make sense. Elijah's response reveals his heart for God. He didn't need all the details. He didn't need all the details. He just needed God to give him a command, and he was ready to obey. This is why I say that Elijah is sold out for the Lord. He is sold out for the Lord. When God speaks, he moves. Elijah doesn't object. He doesn't point out the difficulties that might, might lay ahead, try to reason with God. God, maybe you should send the rain first, and then I can come out, and then we can claim this, this great victory. No. When God speaks, he moves. What a lesson for us. God's call is enough to spur the prophet into action. Elijah is sold out for the Lord. Now let's contrast this with this other man, Obadiah. We're introduced to him in verses 3 through 6. Obadiah is a man of great contradiction. On one hand, the Bible tells us that he feared the Lord greatly. On the other hand, we we find him challenging God and and the prophet Elijah. He cannot be fully exonerated, nor can he be totally condemned. He's a mixture of good and bad. There are different angles that we could view Obadiah from. Some say that he's an example of God placing someone in a dark place to show that God is active even in places that we don't think he is. Even in the darkest places, God has somebody in there working behind the scenes. God is still active. There is certainly some some validity to that viewpoint, and and maybe we'll explore that another time. But for me, when when I view him in light of the totality of the story that's presented to, to us here in Scripture, in light of that, for me, he's a glaring example of, selfish, of a selfish and self-centered believer. Someone that is sold out all right. Someone that is sold out all right, but they've sold out to the world. He can teach us a lot about what not to be. Sometimes a, a negative example can be a powerful one. So let's, leak, let's look at the contradictions. We see the contradictions in, first, his faith. His faith. Obadiah's name means servant of Jehovah. That's what his name means, servant of Jehovah. That's quite a name to live up to, right? It's quite a name to live up to. Kind of like being, what, named a Christian, maybe? Right? His faith is seen in two things here. First, in his devotion. It says In verse 3, it says that Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Now, that's a great thing to be known for. I mean, that's a, a good thing. If you want to be known for something, to be described as someone that fears the Lord greatly, he must have had an understanding of who, Jehovah's, who, who Jehovah was and, and what he could do. People were to describe me, that's one thing I would want them to say about me. Well, he feared the Lord greatly. It's a compliment to be known as someone who feared the Lord greatly. And then we see his deeds. Verse 4 tells us that when Jezebel began to exterminate the, the Lord's prophets, Obadiah took a hundred of them and hid them in caves by fifty. He fed them with bread and water. This was a deed that required great courage, effort, and expense even on his part. Even more since he was a part of Ahab's government. So for this, he's, he's to be commended. Jezebel had gotten word of what he had done, he would have surely been killed. Obadiah holds a a high position in the court of Ahab, says that he is over the household of Ahab. He's in a position that requires trust, faithfulness. But he has a secret. He has a secret. Actually, two secrets. That if Ahab knew, would have meant death for him. And here lies the contradiction. 
in Ahab, or in Obadiah. See, the, the Bible tells us here that Obadiah is a closet believer. He believes in God and he fears Jehovah, but he isn't about to tell anyone. If he were to stand up and declare his faith in God, he would have been killed on the spot. While he did not let his true faith become known, it also appears that he did serve God in secret. In secret. So it's clear that Obadiah has a few positive marks. However, it's, it's really sad when people serve God in secret. In secret. It's, it's a shame when those who, who know the Lord sell out to the Lord. We see that in his compromise. The evidence of Obadiah selling out and compromise is seen in verses 5 through 6. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself. Obadiah went in the other direction by himself. In these two verses, we find Obadiah actively involved in service to Ahab. Remember evil king Ahab? Basically, Obadiah is guilty of, of two great sins of compromise here. First, he's employed by the wrong people. Verse 3 says that Obadiah was over the household of Ahab. Some believe that he was like a governor. He was like a governor. He took, of, he took care of everything for Ahab. He was, he was basically Ahab's right-hand man. So well trusted that when a very important job came up, Ahab only trusted himself and Obadiah to do it. He's in a job that requires him to compromise so that he can keep it. Ahab tolerated him because he knew that he should be able to trust him. Of course, this is supposed to be a religious man, so I can put him over, house, over my household and, and things because he should be trustworthy. So Ahab tolerated him, but Obadiah also knew to keep his mouth shut or else. Ahab had searched everywhere, everywhere for Elijah. Jezebel had slaughtered the prophets so much that, that Obadiah had to hide these prophets in, in caves. So Obadiah compromised. He went to work for the very people that are leading his nation astray. Now some would argue that, well, he could be a, a good influence there. And maybe he could have been, but that's his other sin of compromise. Because he's also participating in sinful activities with them. In verse 5 through 6, Ahab and Obadiah set out on a quest to find some green grass. They split up. Ahab says, you go that way and I'll go this way. Look everywhere. Hopefully we can find some, some green grass for the horses. For the horses. Ahab and Obadiah seem to have no concern for the starving people. They're out looking for grass to feed some horses. This shows a real lack of compassion and care. Not just from this so-called king, but this supposedly godly man. Besides that, Obadiah is also helping Ahab do something that is forbidden Forbidden by the law of God. The kings of, the kings of Israel were not allowed to keep many horses. Read Deuteronomy 17. Talks about that. That the king is not to keep many horses. This was ironically a prohibition so that the king would not rely on his military strength, but on the Lord instead. This could have been a, a really good time for Obadiah to remind Ahab of that. 
but he didn't. Of course, Obadiah's actions stand in stark contrast to those of Elijah. You see, Obadiah was busy looking for grass to save a bunch of nags. Elijah was looking for God to save a nation. The point is, God's command to his people is crystal clear. He demands that we separate from the world, from the things that are evil. 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. We're just be separate from the world. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Surely Obadiah thought that, that uh, he was doing the right thing. Imagine he thought he could serve God in that position some way. However, what ended up happening is that Obadiah found himself pulled into a life of compromise and powerlessness before God. That is almost always the case. You might think you can lift the world around you by being involved in it, but the opposite is true. You will not improve the world, but the world will eventually drag you down to its level. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. You can't hang out with evil people. You can't hang out with evil people and expect them not to corrupt you eventually. Yes, we are to be, to be light in a dark world. But we're not to be part of it. You don't save the drunk by hanging out at the bar with them. You certainly don't help them by giving them a ride there either. Remember the lesson of Lot told in 2 Peter 2, 7 through 8. And if he rec rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul after their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. See, Lot lived in Sodom. He thought he could be a light there. But he didn't improve Sodom no matter how hard he tried. God had to rescue him out of there. And he lost his entire family as a result. We can't be part of a sinful world. We are to be a light and salt in that world. But we don't participate in it. We don't get down in the mud with them. You can't do that and expect yourself to stay clean. While we're at it, this goes for sending your school, your, your kids to public school right now. Using the excuse that they're salt and light in that pit of darkness right now. How dare you? They are not fully trained warriors yet. They're in training. You have a hard time standing against that stuff gets that garbage, and you're going to put them in there? You're supposed to be protecting and guarding them. Now, I understand for some, there is no, there, you don't have an option. For some, they don't have, they, they feel they don't have an option but to do that. But for many, you've simply compromised. You've simply compromised. You've chosen something else that is more important than the sacrifice that would be required to not send them there. You want to have a two-household income so you can have two new cars and a nice big house and go on nice vacations. That's more important than your child being in a cesspool. Look, turn on the news. You know what's going on in the public schools right now. 
Vody Bakum says, if you send your children to Caesar to be educated, you should not be surprised when they come back as Romans. Take sacrifice. Believe me. But it's worth it. Souls of my children being protected from that garbage is worth more than driving a new car. It's worth more than the Kalamazoo promise with a free college education. Why would I, why would I want something free to further send them to someplace even more evil? Sometimes we get our things a little mixed up. Obadiah found himself in a position where he was in direct disobedience. He was guilty of compromise in helping sinners commit sin against God. He may have known God, but he knew nothing of the power of God. That's seen in his excuses. We see that in verses 7 through 14 when, when they meet. When Ahab's boy meets God's man, we see the contrast in them. Obadiah recognizes the man of God when they meet. Is it you, my lord, Elijah? He is quick to show reverence to the man of God, but of course, of course, no one else is around to see it. It's always the way of a compromiser. He'll do it in secret. Elijah says yes, and he sends Obadiah to tell Ahab that he has returned. He says, tell your lord, behold, Elijah is here. Now, there's a whole discussion that we can have about the word Lord that's used throughout this section, maybe another time. But Obadiah is Ahab's servant. And so he should go find him. That's what Elijah says. Go find your boss, the one that you serve. How does Obadiah respond to this? By pointing his finger at Elijah. Accuses Elijah of trying to get him killed. How have I sinned against you that you would send me to be killed? See, his reverence to the prophet in verse 7 means nothing now. His accusation in verse 9 revealed the true character of his heart. He had no respect for the man of God. The mission or the word of God at all. The same can be said of anyone that places themselves or the world before the Lord. They have no respect for things of God, regardless of what they may say. When push comes to shove, oh, wait a minute, let's talk about this. Those who love the Lord will honor him by actively obeying him and responding in faith and not doubt. It's very revealing when a person responds to the commands of God with doubt, accusation, and, and resistance. It reveals that they're not in love with the God that they claim to serve. It proves that there is a problem in their heart. Obadiah begins to offer up one excuse after another. Reasons why he can't do what Elijah is telling him to do. And these excuses reveal the hypocrisy that is hiding in his heart. That's his, his personal fears. We see that in verses 9, 12, and 14. His first objection is that if he does this, that he'll be put to death for it. Three times he expresses his fear of Ahab. He will kill me. If I go there, he's going to kill me. If I go tell him and he comes back and you're not here, he's going to kill me. He's going to kill me. He doesn't believe that God has the ability to protect him from Ahab. Now, I want to say that Obadiah's fears were not totally unfounded. They're not, you know, irrational or, or pulled out of thin air. Ahab was evil. Jezebel had killed the other prophets. He knew what they were capable of. So his fear was not irrational, but he allowed that fear to overtake his faith to overcome what he was supposed to be known for, to have feared the Lord greatly, to believe in the awesome power of the Lord God Almighty. 
Now he's trembling in fear of Ahab. In karate, Caleb and I are, are, are doing karate together. As part of the opening there, one of the, there's some questions that the sensei, the instructor, gives to the class. As we're standing there, and we have, to re, we have to respond to him. And one of the questions he asks is, is does fear exist in this dojo? And the reply is, no, sensei. The Lord says, fear not for I am with you. Of course, that's Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. If you ever come to the place where you start to believe that, you, that God can't, or he won't take care of you, you need to do a little checkup. You've stopped trusting God and, and you've started to trust other things. And that's always an indication of sin in the heart. That's a dangerous place to be. The Lord says, fear not, for I am with you. Amen. Amen. And then we see, we see Obadiah's pathetic faithlessness. Verses 10 through 12. Here he tells Elijah that Ahab has been looking, looking for him everywhere, in every country around. And he's made all of these kings take an oath that they do not know where, where he is. He even questions the faithfulness of God in verse 12. He says, if I do this and I leave, the Spirit will take you away. He says, God's going to do a bait and switch on me here. He's going to leave me high and dry. And I'm going to be left holding the bag. If I step out in faith, God's, God's not going to be there. He's going he's to make me stand all by myself. It'll be a mockery. I'll be left holding the bag. He's been so indoctrinated into Baalism that he's come to believe that God is no better than Baal. He doesn't even believe that, that God will honor his word. He has no faith in God in God's word or, or God's man that's standing before him. He's been brought to a place where his faith is pathetic and weak. When we reach this place in our spiritual lives, we are in serious trouble. When we begin to believe that God is unable to do what he's promised, when we lose faith in him and in his word, that's a sure sign that you are out of the will of God. And you need to repent, and you need to seek his face. Numbers 23, 19, just to remind you, says, God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. As he has said, and will he not do it? Or is, has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? Believe in the Lord to do what he says he will do. He doesn't lie. He cannot lie. If he, if he says it, you can bank on it. Don't doubt. Don't fear. He is able and he is faithful. And we see Obadiah's contradiction, his, his compromise in his past fruit in verse 13. In this verse, he takes the, the position that he's too good for this job that Elijah's asking him to do. He says, hey, have, haven't you heard about me? Have you heard about me? I, I'm, the, I'm the whole prophet-saving guy, you know? Surely the Lord has told you about me. I saved, I saved a hundred of his prophets. That's That's me. I'm not a messenger boy. I'm the prophet-saving guy. Why would God or a prophet risk losing a man with, with my connections? Besides, doesn't God think that Obadiah has, has done enough already? He says, I feared the Lord from my youth. I've been doing this a long time. I've been a Christian a long time. Now you want me to do this? 
seems a little beneath me. Obadiah seems to be living on his past works. Maybe he feels that being right with God and serving God in the past is enough to make up for his backsliding today. When we come to the place in our spiritual life where you, where you have to point back to what you used to do, instead of being able to, for people to see what you're doing now, you're in trouble. Sadly, many believers are right there this morning. You hear things like, I worked in Bible school for years. Now it's time for someone else to do it. Or, well, I taught class for a long time. I I need a break. I used to go to church a lot. I used to serve God. I used to be faithful. What about today? What are you doing for God this morning? Don't fall into the same trap that claimed Obadiah. Serve God in the here and now, not the then and when. Now sure, sometimes sometimes we need a little time of rest. A little time of refreshment. We've been serving a long time. We reach different stages in life. The type of service that we do may change. That's okay. I understand that. Believe me, I understand that. So catch your breath. Catch your breath. Heal up. Get rested. Get refreshed. And then get back to whatever it is that God has for you to do today. Numbers 8.23 26 is the only verses in the Bible that even come remotely close to talking about retirement in the Bible. There is no retirement in the Bible. This is the only verse that even comes remotely close, remotely close. And in here, it talks about the Levite priest, once they reach 50 years old, to stop doing the work inside. Let the young men take that over. You go outside and work. You don't retire. Your position just changes. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If you are still drawing breath, there is something that you can and should be doing for the Lord Today. Next, we see the compromise in his response. Elijah gives him his word and he invokes the Lord as the guarantee. He reminds Obadiah who is supposed to be, who he is supposed to be, the servant of Jehovah. Obadiah reluctantly agrees to go find Ahab and, and tell him the news. And as Obadiah walks away, we never hear from him again. We never hear from him again. Did Ahab kill him as he feared? Probably not. Most likely, he just simply faded back into the woodwork. Probably continued his life of compromise and disobedience. It was a life that could have been greatly used by the Lord. But because of his reluctance, his lack of faith, and his compromise, he's a man who, who never really amounted to much for the glory of God. Now think about this. Later in this same chapter, Elijah is all alone when he confronts Ahab and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Elijah is all alone. If Obadiah had been all he claimed to be, he would have been right there, right there with Elijah. But he wasn't. How sad. How sad. 
So Obadiah had, had a few positive marks on his record. However, it's, it's truly, truly sad when people only serve God in secret. An utter shame that when those who know the Lord sell out to the world. Obadiah was good. He was good, all right. He was good at getting along, at going with the flow. He wanted to, to get along with King Ahab because the cost of not doing so would have, been, would have been pretty great. He was more concerned with his reputation than his responsibility. He didn't want to disrupt the status quo. There are a lot of Obadiahs in our churches today. People who don't want to rock the cultural boat. More concerned with pleasing people than pleasing God. More concerned with being politically correct than biblically correct. Because of a desire to fit in with the crowd. Or because of a job. Or to keep a friend. They have chosen to keep silent about what they really believe. Far too, far too often God's children join the secret service. They just become members of the secret service. They conceal their faith in God so they can save faith, face with, with men. Secret service. Are they believers? I think most of them probably are. But there's a limit to their devotion, a limit to their courage. Obadiah suffered from an ailment that is still pretty prevalent today called DWR. DWR, dedication with reservation. I'm dedicated to the Lord. I'll stand boldly for Him. They serve God when it's convenient, when it's not costly. When it doesn't affect their reputation among non-believers. What a tragedy. What a slap in the face of the Lord. When we consider what Jesus suffered to, to redeem our souls from hell. How could we be ashamed? How could we be ashamed to be identified with him? Jesus said in Mark 8.38, Whoever is ashamed of him before men, he will be ashamed of when he returns. So I want you to think about that. Next time you have opportunity to speak up for Christ and you don't. When I think of Obadiah, one word comes to mind. Compromise. Compromise. Obadiah has chosen to live his life somewhere between God and the world. He has chosen a position that, that forces him to conceal who he really is. He has chosen to hide his faith in God, to protect his life, as if that's really protecting his life. God says, don't fear the one who can, can kill the body. Fear the, the one who can kill the body and the soul. But he's chosen to hide his faith satisfy his greed, to exalt his, his own name, to, to secure his position. He's done what millions do today. Many are willfully hiding their faith in God, their, their biblical convictions, to please a world that doesn't know God and wants no part of God. They do it for the same reason that Obadiah did. They don't want to stand out from the crowd. They don't want to be labeled as different. They're afraid of the cancel culture that we live in. In contrast, we should be like Elijah. We should give this world no reason to doubt our faith in God. May God help us all realize that we are different. We are different. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we are new creations. The old has passed away. We are peculiar people. Titus 2.14, we are a people for his possession. 
zealous for good works. 1 Peter 2.9, a royal priesthood that we may proclaim His excellencies. That's who we are. We're not supposed to fit in because this is not our home. We're pilgrims. We're strangers passing through on our way to heaven, to our home. Let us never, 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 never be guilty of concealing our faith in God. Let us boldly stand beneath the blood-stained banner of the Lord Jesus. Boldly declare our faith and our allegiance to Him without fear, without compromise. Because there is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. Not everyone will appreciate if you take a stand for God. But He will honor your obedience to Him. Besides, who would you rather please? A few people that you may know for a few years here on earth or or God, which you will spend eternity. I wonder if your walk matches your talk. Are you sold out for God or did you sell out? Do you talk a good game or are you really living out what you claim to be? If you're really honest, are are you more like Elijah? One who who did the will of God obediently? Or are you more like Obadiah, who made excuses, lived a life of, of compromise? Who describes you the best? If you need to work on your relationship with God, there is no better place to do that than this altar today. God is dealing with your heart about salvation or service or or total surrender. The place to get it settled is right here. Right here today. Don't wait until tomorrow. You may not know if you have tomorrow. Take care of it today. Listen to the Lord as he speaks to your heart today. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. Amen? Amen. This is not true in your life. Come, make it so today. Altar is open. Altar is open. Come to Him. If you have found yourself in a place of compromise, full of excuses, relying on, on your past, the things that you used to do for God, What are you doing for him today? Repent of that compromise. Repent of that sin. Make it right today so that you can be used of God in a mighty and powerful way so that he will not be ashamed of you when he returns. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come before you humbled. Father humbled by the truth of your word, humbled by the examples that you leave in Scripture for us, mirrors to hold up to compare ourselves to as we seek to become more like Christ. Are we? Are we becoming more like Christ? Or are we like Obadiah? Have we, have we chosen to compromise? Have we chosen things of the world fear and worldly pleasures, whatever they are, are they keeping us from speaking boldly? Have we relegated ourselves to a, a, a life of compromise we, where we, we only serve you in, in secret as long as nobody knows? Father, I pray if that is true of any of us here today that you would convict our hearts of that, that we would repent we would come back to you. You would help us to turn from those compromises in our life, from that fear. We would trust 
solely and fully in you. That we could be used in a mighty and powerful way for your kingdom. Father, we pray that you would do this by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through and for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We're going to close with hymn number 572 today. Is that your story? That is your story. Don't serve him in secret. Sing his praises all the day long. Let people know who your Lord and Savior is. Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you for coming.